so we're going to start with Edith Frisson. Frisson? Frisson is a tax specialist with MNP in Brandon, serving primarily agriculture clients for the past two decades. Edith gets to know her clients clearly, determine their needs, then designs plans to help them successfully move forward. She works closely with the clients to set up their operation in most tax efficient manner with the goal of minimizing their tax burden. I'm just gonna go ahead, that's Edith. Ashley is our second presenter with Edith. Ashley is part of the specialty tax department based out of Brandon office. She is a business advisor and leader with 10 years of experience both in assurance and tax focused primarily on agriculture industry. Edith and Ashley, take it away. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Edith Frieson and I've been working with MNP for about 20 years. Uh, about 15 of those years I've been working in specialty tax. And like was mentioned before, my name is Ashley. I also work out of the MMP office in Brandon in the specialty tax department as well. Our topics today include Bill C-208, a little refresher on what it is and any new legislation or changes that have happened here recently. Um, there's been some changes to alternative minimum tax. Ashley's gonna discuss those and give us some examples. Whoops. My click, my uh, screen went out. And then the third thing we're going to talk about is some new legislation around bear trusts and reporting requirements that probably most of you have but don't realize. So prior to Bill C-208, prior to 2021, a transition of a firm or a business, I'm going to use firm because predominantly that's what we're talking about here today, a transition from a parent to child was not eligible for capital gains treatment. And capital gains treatment is very important because it gives us the lowest tax rate, that 25% tax rate in Manitoba. Um, so in general, the tax professionals felt like it was pretty unfair that if we were selling our business to our own child, we weren't allowed to get capital gains treatment or use our capital gains exemption. But if we were selling to a third party, we would. Um, so why would you ever want to pass on equity and sweat and, you know, something you've built your whole life to some stranger instead of your own child? In 2021, a private member's bill, so Bill C-208, was proposed by our own Larry McGuire, and it proposed that we amend that that section of the Income Tax Act, that legislation, to change intergenerational transfers so that they would be eligible for capital gains exemption and capital gains treatment. There was a second set of rules or a second component to that uh, change in legislation or Bill C-208 that talked about uh, splitting up a company if it was owned by siblings. So in the past, if you and your sibling owned a company, it was a quite onerous process to divide that company into two so that you could each go your own way and make your own business decisions. Um, it involved asking CRA for permission to split the company and uh, we had to do a bunch of back and forth. It was uh, an onerous document. It probably cost taxpayers around seventy-five dollars to $100,000 in fees. And to be honest, I was probably the most excited person in our office when we <laughs> learned that these divisive reorganizations between siblings was gonna be a little bit easier because I was tasked with that job at our, in our office. And I had to talk to the CRA agents in Toronto and Ottawa who asked me things like, what's a co-op equity account? Or could I live in a Quonset in February in uh, Verdon, Manitoba. So they knew very little about farming, so I welcome this change. So that has been implemented. That change for in the legislation has taken place. We've used it several times since 2021. It hasn't, they haven't proposed any changes to that legislation, so we're all super excited about it. What I'm gonna talk about today is the changes to the intergenerational transfer rules. So before I get started, I just want to give you a little bit of a rundown on what is capital gains exemption. So most people are sort of familiar with it. It's that, hundred, uh, that million dollars that's available to everybody in Canada, every taxpayer in Canada. 
And essentially what it is, is when you have a capital gain of a million bucks, you're able to shelter the tax on that capital gain using your exemption. The kicker is that it's only available for use on certain types of assets. And farming is actually um, one of the businesses or industries where we can use it quite frequently. We can use it on shares, farm partnership interest, farmland, quota, all types of things that you guys would be familiar with. These methods or these strategies are very helpful to farming, but C-208 introduced the opportunity to sell the shares from parents to children and create something that's called shareholder loan. And shareholder loan is great because we take the asset, we sell it to our kids, we record a, a million dollar gain on our personal tax return. It's sheltered by capital gains exemption, so we actually pay zero pure tax. And then mom and dad can pull that money out over time. So they don't have to take wages, they don't have to take dividends. Mom and dad have very little income to report in the future. As tax professionals, we get really excited about that because we love saving our clients money. So as a little uh, rundown, the old rules for C-208 um, included, we could, only, we could only do it if we had a QSBC, so a small, qualified small business corporation or qualified farm property. The purchaser company had to be controlled by your children. Um, and the purchaser corporation or your children's corporation had to hold the shares for at least 60 months after purchase. That stayed the same, changed a little bit, but I'm gonna get into that in a little while. And we had to provide a valuation for the shares. That requirement has gone away as of January 1st, 2024, and it's a welcome change. Because what it involved was clients providing us, us with fair market values for every asset in the firm. We'd have to send it away, every liability as well. We'd have to send that away to our evaluator. He would come up with a report. It was time consuming, costly, complicated. That requirement's gone away, so um, that's definitely a good thing in this, in this new legislation. So as a quick rundown, the Bill C-208 new rules have two separate components. And I think what CRA and what the Minister of Finance was trying to do is we're trying to make a transaction between parent and parent, parents and children, it has to mirror a pure transition, a pure sale. So they've implemented an, Im Im an immediate transition plan, which is over three years, or a gradual transition plan, which is over five to 10 years. And they've uh, put requirements into five different categories. One, you have to transfer control of the business. So that could be factual control or legal control. Legal control is the actual voting of the common shares or voting of the shares. Factual control is really dads in the background still controlling everything that happens on the farm, which would never happen. Um, you have to transfer all your equity. There has to be a transfer of management. So. Um, management would include who's making decisions daily about the operation. So what are we going to seed? Where are we going to seed it? What are we going to spray? How are we going to harvest? How many hired men do we hire? All that is included in management. That has to transition to the next generation. It can't stay with mom and dad. Um, the purchaser corporation has to control the business for a set amount of time. And the purchaser is required, like the actual individuals are required to continue to work inside of the organization or inside of the business for a certain amount of time. So who would be an ideal candidate for this type of transaction? Well, it would be a family firm usually controlled by mom and dad, and mom and dad are ready to transition the firm to the next generation. The next generation is ready or almost ready to take over that firm, and usually the almost ready comes with management skills and knowledge, how to make those daily decisions, how to make sure that the firm remains successful. Also a kicker is mom and dad have not used their capital gains exemption yet, or maybe they have a substantial portion of their capital gains exemption still available for use. So how does C-208 work? So mom and dad, like I said, they own the family farm corporation and they're ready to transition to son or daughter. Son or daughter goes out, goes to their lawyer, asks for a new company that they're going to control um, and we were off and running. So like I said, in my example, mom and dad have a family farm corporation that's worth $2 million, probably worth more than that, but I'm just using that because I'm bad at math. 
Um, so, and the kids have their new company like I had on my previous slide. So now what happens is that new company owned by the children would either go out and get a loan in order to buy mom and dad's shares, or maybe we decide that we're going to finance this deal using operations. So we don't have to pay mom and dad back right away. We can do it over time. So maybe the farm's going to generate enough uh, cash in the future to pay out mom and dad. So that new company would buy mom's shares and dad's shares. So mom would have a $1 million capital gain on her personal tax return, and it would be sheltered by her $1 million capital gains exemption, so she'd pay almost no tax. And same with dad. So essentially, we've created a new company uh, that owns the Family Farm Corp, and that new company owes mom and dad two million bucks. So we draw that out over time. Mom and dad never have to report any kind of income from this transaction or from the farm ever again, um, over and above this two million dollars, unless they need more than that to live on. I have this slide here to just sort of compare. So if we did a C-208 transaction, mom and dad have $2 million of after-tax cash to spend on whatever they want, trips to Mexico, um, lavish cars, whatever they want. If we did pull that money out as a dividend, which would be another option for sure, um, mom and dad, if they pulled it out all at once, we would be looking at a 46% tax rate. So um, doing C-208 definitely leaves you a bunch more after-tax cash than doing dividends. So if we wanted to fall into this legislation, how would we? So you would have to choose between the immediate transition plan or the gradual transition plan. In the immediate transition plan, you'd have to be ready to transfer legal and factual control over three years. So immediately you'd have to do the majority, and then over three years you'd have to make sure you gave all the control to the children. You'd also have to transfer management of the business over the next three years. So all those management decisions would have to become part of the children's responsibilities, not mom and dad's anymore. In this scenario, the child has to retain control for at least 36 months. So they can't sell for 36 months. And they have to be involved in the business for 36 months. So we can't just do this and mom and dad continue operating the farm and the child lives in you know, Bermuda or somewhere. If your child isn't quite ready, then maybe the five to 10 year transition plan works a little better. In this, in this scenario, you would transfer legal control, so just the votes. You could still participate in kind of the factual um, control of the company. You transfer majority in the, you know, in the beginning, and then the, over the next 36 months, you transfer most of the control. Over the next 10 years, you'd have to make sure that mom and dad had no more equity in the company. They would transfer management decisions to the children within a reasonable amount of time, which is always up for, for grabs, but probably within that five years. Um, I think you'd be pushing it for 10 years. We really want to make sure that our plan mirrors what we would do for a third-party transaction um, in order to remain within the confines of CRA's rules. And the child would have to be involved in the business for at least five years. What's the best option for your family? Well, it probably depends on how ready everybody is to transition. Are mom and dad ready to give it up, give up everything right away? Are the children ready to take on that management role? Um, sometimes we see that children need a bit of training to get the skills and knowledge to the point where they are able to um, continue and make the farm continue to be a success. Some other considerations you might want to take into account if you're thinking about doing a C-208. In the year, you use your capital gains exemption, and that's not just for this transaction, but for any transaction. You could uh, claw back your old age security payments or your child tax benefits. You could trigger alternative minimum tax, and this is actually something my colleague Ashley's gonna talk about, but alternative minimum tax is essentially a large, a large sum of tax you have to pay to CRA, and then if you have an appropriate um, types of income in the next seven years, you'll actually get credit for it and, and get it back from CRA. And it will also impact pharmacare or other social benefit programs. Now, if you did the five to 10 year or gradual plan, there's actually a way that we could mitigate some of these clawbacks and alternative minimum tax, but you definitely have to talk to your tax professional to make sure that you're falling within those rules. 
Uh, if you did choose the five to 10 year plan, you're keeping everything open for reassessment for an extra 10 years. Um, so usually CRA would, you know, everything would become statute barred about three years after you file your tax return. If you do this plan, you're keeping yourself open to, to reassessment from CRA for an additional 10 years. If we've done everything correctly, that shouldn't be a problem, but <laughs> always a risk. I also want to mention that mom and dad have to give up control and they have to give up management, but they could still be employees because I know sometimes folks want to continue to drive the combine or the tractor. We can continue to pay them as employees. It's just that we have to pay them a reasonable wage. So whatever we're paying our hired man, that's what we'd also have to pay our mom and dad. Um, so what's next for your family? I'm not sure. If you want to meet with us and chat about it, we'd be more than happy to. Um, there's lots of traditional ways to bring your children into the farm. A gift still works, a freeze still works. This is really just another tool in our toolbox that could help your family pay very less tax overall. Like I said, it's a complex and um, it's a complex transaction and needs to be documented well. So please be sure to include an accountant or a lawyer if you're planning to do this. So the next item we're going to talk about is the alternative minimum tax, which is known as AMT, which Edith has brought up. So what is it? It's an alternative method to calculate taxes in Canada, and you might have paid it before if you had claimed your capital gains exemption like Edith had discussed. Um, and again, like she mentioned, it's a kind of like a prepayment of tax, but you can get it back over the next seven years. So it has ch there was legislative changes that have happened that came into effect January 1st of 2024. Um, the seven years is still there, but what has changed, it is now calculated differently and the things it applies to have changed. So it now applies to sales where you haven't used your capital gains exemption, where before it only kicked in if you did use your capital gains exemption. Um, and if you are using your capital gains exemption, it now won't kick in until you have a gain over 550000 where before it was 130000 So we're going to look at a few examples. So if you sold some farmland and had a million dollar gain and you didn't have any of your lifetime capital gains exemption left, in the old rules, you would pay no AMT. Under the new changes, you would pay almost 42000 um, and another example, the same land you sold, you had a million dollar gain. This time you used your full exemption. Under the old rules, you would have paid just over 58,000. And under the new calculation, it's 39,000. So there's about a $20,000 savings there. And then the last example we'll look at is a $2 million gain. So half of it's covered by your capital gains exemption. So under the old calculation, you would have paid almost 26000 And under the new um, calculations, you're paying almost 134000 And just to note that this is both federal and Manitoba AMT. And so there's nothing we can really go about to avoid this. It's just something to know that if you do some transactions in the new years, that this will affect your cash flow for the good or the bad. And then the last item we're going to talk about is bear trusts. So the federal government introduced new reporting requirements for bear trusts and what would qualify as a bear trust. Um, and a bear trust is a legal relationship where the legal ownership and the beneficial interests are not the same. So it's the simplest form of a trust and usually has not been legally documented by your lawyer, but going forward should be. So I'm going to go through a bunch of examples of where you might have a bear trust and you should be reporting it. So if you have a farm corporation, if you have corporate buildings that are on personal land, you have a bear trust. So if you have bins, a barn that is in your corporation but is on personally held land, that's a bear trust. If you have personal buildings that's on corporate land, so maybe you built a home and it's on your corporately owned land, that is a bear trust. And another example is where you have land that was transferred to a corporation, but the legal title still has your individual names listed. Um, we're going to look at some examples for a farm partnership. 
So these are a little bit similar to the corporation ones we just looked at. So where there is a partnership building on personal land, um, where there is a personal building on partnership land, so this includes all farm partnerships, as partnerships cannot hold legal title of land. Um, some more examples are where land has been transferred to a partnership as part of a reorganization, and where land has been purchased by the partnership. So if you are in a land partnership, you will have bear trusts that need to be filed. So some examples for individuals, if you added your title or your child to a land title, if you added them to a bank account and at any point in the year that bank account was over $50,000, these are bear trusts. If you added them to investments or if you have co-signed for a mortgage for your child, this would also be a bear trust. And these are only some of the examples, there are many, many other examples out there. And so why are these bear trusts important for you to know? So every bear trust needs to file a T3 trust income tax and information return for the year ending December 31st, 2023. So this, the due date to file these is 90 days after December 31st, which the date sometimes changes if there's a leap year or if it falls on a weekend. And what's most important is if you the failure to file annually results in a penalty of $2,500 or 5% of the highest amount of the fair market value of the property within the trust, which there is some discussion on this calculation, but nevertheless, this is a high penalty. Um, CRA has stated that they will provide relief by waiving the penalty for the 2023 tax years if they're filed late. But they've also said if the failure to file is due to gross negligence, a different penalty will apply. So some documents that you should find and bring to your lawyer or your accountant or tax advisor to see if you have a bare trust that should be filed. You should look at your property tax statements, your fixed asset listings, your lease agreements, legal documents, subdivisions, and we're just asking that you reach out to any, for your lawyers, or your accountants, to see what you have to file because we won't know any of some of these relationships that you have. So before I talk about or finish up, we also wanted to mention if you have a SIBA loan still outstanding, that the due date to get that repaid is January 18th. So you only have a couple more days to get those repaid. And then we just want to say thanks for listening. And if you have any questions at all, you can stop by our booth and we'll be happy to answer them. Or else you can scan this QR code and an email will pop up for you. Thanks. <laughs>